Hi there. My name is Megan Leslie and I'm the president and CEO of WWF Canada. And at WWF Canada, we're working towards a future with abundant wildlife where nature and people thrive. And we work with nature from coast to coast to coast. And I'm so proud to lead an organization full of dedicated staff, volunteers and supporters like you all working for nature. And I'm coming to you live from a giant thunderstorm in Toronto. So if you see a flash of light or hear that rumbling, I am not outside of a dance club. It is live and happening outside of my window. Uh, so you might see or hear some of the effects of that. I am really excited to co-host this week's episode of Wildlife Wednesday because this week we're talking about monarch butterflies. With their beautiful and distinct orange, black and white markings, Monarchs are easily one of the most recognizable butterfly species in the world. They're also marathon migrators. Every fall, monarchs set out the incredible four to 5,000 kilometer journey from Southern Canada to the forests of Mexico. It's the longest migration of any insect. Now, WWF is a global network and where I work at WWF Canada, we'll, we work alongside our neighbors to the US at WWF US and also with WWF Mexico to conserve monarch habitat. And that's why I am so pleased oh, <laughs> to introduce with uh, lights and sound, I'm so pleased to introduce my co-host for today, Maria Jose Villanueva, Director of Conservation at WWF Mexico. I brought the lights for you, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great way to start our conversation. I feel super important. Thank you so much. The timing of that. Um, I'm very <laughs> excited to meet you, and so is Mother Nature. Uh, but uh, <laughs> So let's let our viewers get to know you a little bit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and also how you started working with monarchs. Thank you, Megan, and so happy to be with you today on this very nature-like day. <laughs> uh, so um, I am, a, I've been working with uh, nature for my whole life. I am a biologist by profession. I have a PhD in marine science. Uh, I've devoted my life to, to marine species at some point, but now my heart has been won by monarchs jaguars and other many uh, mm. terrestrial creatures. I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to live in a mega diverse country such as Mexico. And uh, I, I think that that has made me the privilege of, of knowing so much of my life. And, and for WF, I've been working since 2011 and I am sharing the work with many, many expert colleagues. We have one of our most world-renowned experts on monarchs working on our program, Eduardo Rendon. And I am going to talk about that species in, in his behalf. Great. Well, as you heard, not only am I uh, coming to you from a thunderstorm, uh, but I'm also, I'm, you know, Canada's a big country, Mexico's a big country. I'm in downtown Toronto, which is really, I guess, sort of the most northern uh, reach of the monarchs. So where exactly are you in Mexico? Well, that's funny of you to ask because I am actually in the in the backyard of the monarch territory when they come to overwinter here. I am in Valle de Bravo, that it's outside of, of Mexico City. Uh, and I am very close to a sanctuary called Piedra Herrada. And in fact, today when I was drinking my tea outside in the garden, I saw a monarch going through some of the resident populations that are still here. So yeah. yes. Lucky. Um, so before we get started on, you know, the, the scientific nuts and bolts of the monarchs, I guess, uh, this is such a great opportunity to learn from you and to learn also about the cultural significance of monarchs to people in Mexico. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think that it would be difficult not to mention that intrinsic relationship there is with our cultures and biodiversity. We have a vast array of ethnics and in the monarchs, we have the Purepecha culture that has had uh, many years of them watching the, the monarchs come to hibernate here. And they have uh, traditions believing that the monarchs, in the wings of the monarchs, they come the, the dead to visit them. And as you know, in Mexico, uh, we have a very, very important day at the beginning of November, that it's the day of the dead. And it is uh, mm -hmm. related to the monarch coming uh, to the wintering grounds. So there mm -hmm. is a lot of cosmogony around uh, the monarch and it's very much embedded in our culture and the communities that live around monarch tourism. 
in the yeah. in the winter. You know, it's interesting here in Canada, certainly monarchs are part of our, our history and a little bit of part, part of our culture, but I feel like there's a, a reawakening happening for people about monarchs. They're really um, capturing people's imaginations these days. Uh, I wanted to... Um, note for people who are watching that if you have questions you can put them in the chat function but hey you're already doing it so that's great and jeff reed stole my first question maria uh because i wanted to ask you a bit about the migration of the monarchs i mean this is the thing that is so breathtaking i mean it's hard to even wrap your head around it's so so far and so long and they're these tiny little insects can you tell us a bit about the migration those are the wonders of nature that make me think that every day I'm doing the right yeah. job. Uh, such a small insect, less than a gram of weight, can do a journey of more than 4,000 kilometers up to 5,000 kilometers. It's absolutely crazy when you think about it. But the, the reason why monarchs have done this, it's because they have developed and evolved a, a, a way that they can sprout new generations, up to four to five generations that start covering on the beginning of, uh, of spring, they start to cover the territory in the US and Canada, mm -hmm. uh, up to four to five uh, generations. In September, due to cues on the environment, the monarchs come up with a generation called the Methuselah generation okay. that, that can live for seven to eight months. Uh, it's, uh, it's if we were to live like 500 years. And they mm -hmm. come all the way down to the Oyamel forest in Mexico on November, they hit the ground. They stay here and on spring, early spring, they break uh, what we call sexual dormancy or mm -hmm. uh, diapause. And that is what enables them to live for so long. So we we spend a lot of energy on, on mating. <laughs> we know mm -hmm. that. And <laughs> the monarchs have managed to evolve so that generation is not sexually active. So once they break that diapos, they can mate and then go back and they only have a couple of weeks left of living to put their first generation and start again the cycle. So okay. it's really fine tuning. It's yeah. so, so there's, I know you just said this, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. So there are multiple, like when they're in Canada in our summer, there are multiple generations. Yes. And then at the end of the summer is this Methuselah generation. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And it's it's sprout by environmental cues that that is why monarchs are so uh, vulnerable to climate change, okay. because there's such re it's such a relationship on that environmental cues that any changes on that can really yeah. stop uh, the migration. And so but then it's not the same generation going back and forth no. and back and forth. Okay. So the monarchs that are here in Michoacan, they've never been here. So four to five generations before their fathers mm. were there. So wow. how they come and go exactly to the same spot, yeah. it's, it's impressive. Now, Maria, when we did your intro or we did the intro of this, I don't know if you saw the video clip, there's like thousands of monarchs in the air. And it, it got me thinking about um, how many there are, but also uh, about how many eggs they lay. I mean, uh, my understanding is they lay quite a few eggs at once. Yeah. They can lay up to 300 eggs uh, in, in in a time. They they lay a small amount of eggs in each of the milkweed uh, stems. Mm -hmm. They they use a particular plant called called milkweed uh, yeah. that has a toxic uh, substance that enables and protects the larvae when they when they grow and the caterpillars. And uh, yeah, and when you were talking how many monarchs when you see them flying, it's very difficult to measure the number. So what we measure what we measure here in Mexico is how much extension do they cover? Uh, but they they do lay a very large amount of eggs. So we have monarchs here in Mexico by the millions when they come to migrate here. Okay. Um, Aiden had a, a question in the chat. So about how many eggs they lay. So that's uh, great. We could answer your question, Aiden. Um, so continuing with this life cycle. So they lay the eggs. There's multiple generations here in Canada. In that individual life cycle, how long does it take for the eggs to turn into a butterfly? It's quite fast uh, yeah. in, in the monarch uh, realm. Uh, the, the larvae can take up to two weeks in growing. Uh, four days from the egg to hatch to a, to a caterpillar, or as I said, caterpillars up to two weeks. And then on the in the chrysalid, on the pupae, yeah. they can stay for 10 days. So it's a very, very fast process. Wow. So um, all tomer up maybe three weeks from the egg to a butterfly. So this butterfly coming out right now that we can see on the screen, at what point do they start mating again? 
they start they can start pretty fast uh yeah. for the first four to five generations as right. i've said the methuselah generation does not mate right away and that is the reason why they can live so long of course so, of course so but but the first ones they can mate right away so i wanted to ask a question about milkweed because you you mentioned uh milkweed and so so this plant is incredibly important to monarchs can you explain to people exactly why and how yeah, uh, as I've said, the monarchs look for these uh, plant to lay their eggs because it gives them protection from predators. Uh, so uh, all around North, across North America, we have different species of milkweed. It's important for you to know. And these species uh, are well studied and it's important for us if we want to help out monarchs and put milkweed, we need to look for the native species. Uh, and the reason why it's, it, it's, it's important for us to know this is that sometimes this milkweed is um, under uh, under this it, they're taking as uh, herbs or malicious plants that that uh, damage crops and that's not true. It's mm. very important to understand that, that there is a very nice array of native plants that they are um, seasonal and that these all of, of of what I told you about the phenomenon of migration it's a very delicate balance that yeah. we need to keep to keep so that the, the the diversity of milkweed and the use of milkweed for that particular part of the life cycle it's really important okay. and it's all done from the US to to Canada and uh so i guess in a you said that it milkweed provides shelter as well and i guess in a rainstorm or a thunderstorm like what we're experiencing <laughs> out the window here in Toronto uh i'm assuming the monarchs are hiding out in the milkweed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I can answer one of the questions from the chat that they were asking if they were nocturnal. No, monarchs are, are they, they travel in daylight and at night they roost and rest on particular trees. And for example, here in the migratory route in Mexico, we are trying to identify which trees are preferred best as a resting okay. space. So we have, for example, in the middle of the migrating route, we have had some trees that have been visited for the last 70 years. And I have persons, the people that I've known that took me to that tree and say, wow. they, this is a tree that always helps monarchs roost through their way out to Mexico and they have protected some of these trees. So they're, they have a confirmation that enables them to, to, to bear with uh, cold and wind and all of that. So yeah. Hmm. Um, so on the trees and the protecting of trees and, and planting milkweed, this is a good uh, intro to, I have a question here from Lisa, who points out that it's wonderful to see a strong, educated and empowered woman like you working Thank for you. the benefit of the planet, I agree. Girl and, power. Yes. <laughs> and she was wondering, what can the average person do to help with the preservation of monarchs? So the, the tree example is a good one. I think milkweed probably as well. Yeah. Well, since it's such a such a complex process, right. it is very important. My first step always when people ask me this question is we have to inform ourselves. Yeah. We have to understand on which we're standing. It's not the same action that I would take here in Valle de Bravo in Mexico that you will take in Ontario. Uh, it, it's very important for that. But first of all, inform ourselves. Then I think the Monarchs gives us an opportunity to plant native plants that they can use. It's right. not just milkweed. They right. need nectar plants for their journey home. They need to be chubby, uh, fatty, <laughs> and all good to, to survive through the winter. That is very important. Also, we need to buy and source products from responsible and sustainable sources. Mm -hmm. the, the woods and the forests where the monarchs come and overwinter here in Mexico are crucial. And it's a very small patch that we need to protect. Uh, so all of our consumer decisions affect eventually some natural resource. And in the case of monarchs, it's not the, it's not the exception. Okay. I know here in Canada, um, people do strongly, they, they associate milkweed very much with monarchs and there's been a big push to plant milkweed it, when it is like, let's be honest, it's a plant that we have not traditionally said, oh, this is a beautiful plant I want in my garden. <laughs> yeah. But even on my street, I see all kinds of milkweed. Uh, but it here in Canada, I know, I love the vision of the sending you guys the chubby monarchs at the end of yeah. the season. That's hard Thank to, you. Hard to <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best to send chubby monarchs. Uh, not everybody loves goldenrod, but goldenrod is a great species. It's the end of the summer, full of good sugars for a lot yeah. of pollinators. Uh, aster, or people kind of sometimes say these little purple daisies, aster, New England aster, smooth aster, uh, gray goldenrod, 
yellow goldenrod. These are great options to give uh, pollinators that end of summer burst of energy that they need. So we'll we'll do our best to send you the, the chubby ones. Thank you so much. We will appreciate that. One interesting thing, because um, I mentioned I'm here in a city and I rent, so I can't just build a pollinator garden, but I actually uh, did some pots and was able yeah. to grow some milkweed in pots and they do really well. And I was so proud in year two, I, I was looking on my milkweed, uh, it's year two, it's established in this pot and I saw a little monarch caterpillar and I was like, oh. Oh, it's happening. <laughs> and then the next day it was gone. And I was so sad because of, like somebody ate some creature ate my little caterpillar. <laughs> but I had to remind myself, you know, this is part of it. This is the, the circle of life, as they say. Uh, so I was going to ask you about what are the predators, but maybe a better question is, how do these monarchs fit in that web of life? I mean, are they, uh, are there species that depend on monarchs for food or for other things? Well, definitely, they 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 do feed on a in, in a very in a complex web of of food a food chain. Uh, as I said, monarchs are toxic generally to most species. Are they toxic uh, to us? They could be toxic to anyone. They have tos toxic. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Please don't eat do them that. again. Very good comment. Any monarchs? Yeah, yeah. Not if they're ch even if they're chubby and nice. Uh, no, th but but they do are subject for predation to uh, some species, very adapted ones and evolved ones. And I think it's cre it's very interesting to know, for example, that Orioles uh, have uh, understood and are adapted to eating all all only the abdomen. The, the wings is where they are poisonous. So oh. they only eat the abdomen or for example, but they, we do have animals that eat the whole thing, like mice and other birds, they tend to eat the whole animal and they can and, and, and they can do that. But I think that this is another very important part of life. The, the, the mechanism has made nature, it's constantly evolving. So mm -hmm. it's important for these creatures to eat caterpillars. And uh, believe me with 300 to 500 eggs uh, per monarch I think that that would do, do yeah. that would not be a problem but sorry for your caterpillar <laughs> no no it was a good <laughs> it was a good reminder for me but I I was I felt to nature pretty demoralized the first day until I like reframe the narrative no 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 I just helped a, an oriole or, or some kind of bird <laughs> that's good that's good spirit Maria I'm gonna go to some of the questions I mean I've you've been answering some of the questions as we've gone along and uh, it's been great but there's a couple in here um, uh, Adriana was wondering about uh, about how you you alluded to the fact that it's a bit of a mystery how the monarchs know their way uh, to get down to Mexico is and she'd heard about something in their the DNA of their wings that's almost like a map. Uh, what do we know about how monarchs know where to go? It's it's still a lot of doubts around yeah. that. Uh, there are papers that say that the monarchs are oriented by by the sun, and uh, they are using also uh currents and they use topography to 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 travel faster uh there is a factor around the sun that is mm -hmm. definitely something that triggers it even though when it's uh foggy uh they do have the sensors on their wings as they were mentioning uh that help them uh, navigate when there's a, b a bad weather uh but still much to be understood about that uh for us it's it's striking to see how they can manage to come to the exact same place. I don't know if it's an altitude, uh, manage with uh, orientation, uh, but they come to the exact same place uh, every year. And that is absolutely impressive. But yes, much to be done and much to be researched around that. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and we talked a bit about predators and uh, we talked a bit about the food that they need, whether it's milkweed or, or goldenrod. Uh, that can be impacted by human activity very much. You know, where we're building our homes and our roads is right through monarch habitat. Uh, yep. Vivi has a question, though, about what are there any diseases that affect monarchs? That's a very good question, Vivian. Uh, I think that one important one to mention is that uh, there is a, a, a parasite, a protozoan parasite that uh, grows on monarchs uh, of Yocistis, and they 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 uh, they can lead monarchs to to death. And a problem with uh, saying wanting to help monarchs is that some people have grown uh, tropical milkweed. 
the tropical milkweed does not die, it's perennial. And those, um, those milkweeds host this parasite for longer periods. So it's uh, so anytime a monarch goes into this milkweed, they have a highest highest uh, possibility of contracting this disease, and it's it's having a big effect. And there are a lot of studies around trying to understand better the impacts of tropical milkweed planting and the and the parasitic uh, disease. So it's something to be looking at, and it could be an emergent big threat to monarchs. Yeah, really. Uh, well, it's a little bit, um, Brandon had a question earlier on in the chat uh, asking if it's possible to make artificial milkweed habitat. I mean, you talked about the tropical milkweed, but uh, are there are there milkweed alternatives? Um, not that I that I know of. I think that the carotenoids that the milkweed have, it's, it's not the same for all species. Uh, that is why I, I am saying that it's very important to understand the native species and let the monarchs decide. They can decide by using their their legs and their uh, and uh, th this is how they stand on a plant and say this is the right amount. Uh, because there are milkweeds that could be very toxic, much uh, toxic that can even kill a larvae when they eat it, mm -hmm. and they could be very small uh, toxic, so it's not useful for them to to to. Uh, repel predators. So uh, my, my first thing would, would say, let's stick with the natives. Let's yeah. start making research to have native milkweeds, uh, have nurseries that provide them. And I think that would be right, 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 the right way. Nature, yeah. nature is our best uh, research lab. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, you're right. That's the perfect answer. I mean, sometimes we're overthinking it. We just got to let nature do its job. Exactly. Um, Okay, super. Well, Maria, we've got a little bit of time left. And uh, what I would like to do, I think, I can't remember if I promised this at the beginning, but I promised to you that we would do <laughs> some trivia. So let's, yeah. uh, I think it's trivia time. So uh, let's, let's get started with that. Yeah. Okay, trivia time. Comment with your responses and we'll, uh, we'll do our best. First question. How many times do monarch butterflies flap their wings in a minute? Well, Megan, this yeah, is a tough hints. one. Yeah. What's what are the, some hints? Uh, they are very they are slow butterflies, if I may say. Uh, they don't flap as, as as fast as other ones. They have big wings, so mm -hmm. a lot of energy mm -hmm. to move them around, and they use currents. So I would say let's give it a guess. Let's see what the the the, God, the people I can say. Any guesses yet? What are your guesses, folks? Put it in the chat. I'm I'm gonna guess uh, 50. Brandon says 40 times a minute. Um, uh, not, that not that slow. Not that slow. Out of the sky. <laughs> uh, 300 to 720 times a minute. Okay, that's that's pretty fast actually, but slower than others. You said. Yeah, it, it can be, it, this is around five to 12 uh, times a second. Uh, general butterfly can be 20. Great. 20 times a second, yeah. Next question. Do monarchs sleep or do they just rest? Hmm, I gave you a little pointers on, on some of my first uh, in saying. Yeah. What yeah. would you think that it would be needed to, to oh. sleep for a monarch to do that? Sleep is a tricky issue. Yeah, well, they need beds. They need. <laughs> I mean, what do I do when I go to sleep? I put on some nice music and <laughs> relax. Yeah, yeah, that could be. I don't know. Monarchs have their makeup on, their beautiful scales. Yeah. Adriana's guessing that they sleep. Doreen saying they sleep. Vivi saying they rest. Sarah's saying sleep. We've got a lot of votes for sleep. Monarchs are interactive, uh, inactive when it's dark, but they can't shut their eyes. Amazing. Yeah, I they do not have eyelids, so practically sleep. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did not think of that. <laughs> okay, we got Great. our next question. Next question. A total of four coming up. So this is number three. Roost and rest. Very good, Maya. How long does the Methuselah or late summer generation live for? Okay, we had a good discussion about this. So yeah, I think that that. Yeah. Doesn't need a lot, of, a lot of hints, but remember, it's long, mm -hmm. long time for, for a wait, monarch. Wait, for a butterfly. It's long for, for a, a butterfly. butterfly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would be disappointed yeah. if that was my lifespan. 
Yeah. No, but but in in terms of us, it will be up around a five hundred years. Oh, so right. Yeah. If we. So it will be. It, it it's a lot. How many? I don't see any. Eight months. Ah, Daniel. I know Daniel knows a lot about Mars. Oh, really? <laughs> Susan's saying seven or eight. Vivi's saying eight to twelve. Seven to eight. Susan. Very good, Daniel and Susan. And good. Vivi. Yeah. You, you, you guys are listening carefully. Doreen got in with eight months. Okay. Last question. Oh, Emily put in seven months. I hope it was before we saw the answer, Emily. <laughs> How high can a monarch fly? And can I say that the answer for this, it's a record. Uh, okay. So it's the, the, highest the highest a monarch okay. has been seen flying in the air. This is pretty impressive, yeah. if I can say. Yeah. I this mean, was something that uh, was recorded from somebody who was really far up. Okay. Okay. So not someone standing on the ground just looking no. up. Okay. Nope. Okay. That's a good hint. I'm not good at judging distances. Sarah's come in with uh, 20,000 feet. Yeah, it, it's it, it could be a little bit less than that. A but little it, less than that? The highest monarch was recorded at 3.3 <laughs> kilometers in the air. Come on, that's bananas. That's a hundred, uh, 11,000 uh, feet. How did so, someone see that? They saw it from a plane, from a small plane. They saw a monarch actually there, and that's the highest that's been recorded. Could you imagine if... That was you. I'd be like, what's going on? I'd yeah. check all of my instruments to see if we were crashing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe on a bad day. Yeah, these are powerful, powerful little insects, aren't they? Darlene, very good with 10,000 guests. It's, hey, it's very nice. good. But nice. generally, they, they do travel around uh, a little bit less. It's That's a record. Well, Maria, I can see why you have fallen in love with this subject and why you're so passionate about uh, about it. And we're just delighted that you were able to join us live from Mexico. Uh, no, this was great. Passed just in time. And uh, th that is all the time that we have this week. So I want to thank you for joining us. And thank you for being such a wonderful co-host. And thank you for being such a beautiful host and uh, energetic. I really enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. Well, great. We'll, we'll try to have you back sometime. And sure. for those who are watching, uh, be sure to tune in next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an all-new episode of Wildlife Wednesday. And I'll let you in on something. We don't have a topic yet. So if you have ideas, please put them in the chat because we are all ears. Uh, what do you want to hear about? We'll, we'll try and figure out and get some creative episodes going based on your feedback. Uh, all right, everyone. Thanks so much. This was very fun. And Maria, thank you again. Thanks, thanks so much, Megan, everyone who joined. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.